Kelly Kasser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, airs Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern, and is always available for your listening pleasure at HallieKesserJane.com. And thank you so much for joining me. I am Hallie Kasser Jane. Today on the Hallie Kasser Jane Show, two of the funniest people on the planet. Sitting with me at my table today is one of America's most beloved eccentrics, out with a new book, John Waters, and Seinfeld writer and also the author of a phenomenal new book, Peter Millman. Both men, by the way, will be joining me at the 31st Annual Miami Book Fair International, November 16th through 23rd in downtown Miami at Miami Dade College. But before we begin, a brief message from our sponsors. You are listening to The Hallie Kesser Jane Show, talk radio for fine minds. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is always available online at HallieKesserJane.com, on Blog Talk Radio, and be sure to visit us at our newest home on iHeartRadio. Today, The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is brought to you by Audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. If you want to listen to it, Audible has it. With over 150,000 titles in virtually every genre, you'll find what you're looking for. Get a free audiobook and 30-day trial today by signing up at www.audibletrial.com forward slash The Hallie Casser Jane Show. Hi, this is Hallie Kesser Jane, host of the Hallie Kesser Jane Show, talk radio for fine minds. Join me November 16th through 23rd at the nation's largest book fair, the 31st Miami Book Fair International in warm and sunny Miami at Miami Dade College. Mingle with 400 plus authors from around the world, including Patricia Cornwell, Dave Barry, John Dean, Philip Margolin, Anne Rice, Elizabeth Nunez, and Joanna Rakoff. Listen to the authors read their own words, answer your questions, and autograph your books. For more information, visit MiamiBookFair.com and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. See you there. Hello, I'm Hallie Kasser Jane host of the Hallie Kesser Jane Show. Join me Wednesdays at 3 p.m. Eastern when I talk with the great artists, writers, musicians, politicians, and celebrities of our day. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show is talk radio for fine minds. Tune in live or listen to the podcast at HallieKesserJane.com. John Waters is an American filmmaker, actor, writer, and visual artist, best known for his cult films including Hairspray, Pink Flamingos, and Cecil B. Demented. He is also the author of Role Models, Crackpot, and Shock Value. Now John Waters is out with a new book, and it doesn't disappoint. Billed as a cross-country hitchhiking journey with America's most beloved weirdo, and Carsick, he puts his life on the line when he sets out on a journey, both real and imagined, across the U.S. of A, armed with his wit, his pencil-thin mustache, and a cardboard sign that reads, I'm not psycho, hitchhiking across America from Baltimore to San Francisco, braving lonely roads and treacherous drivers. But who should we be more worried about, the delicate film director with genteel manners or the unsuspecting travelers transporting the Pope of Trash? What really happens when this cult legend sticks out his thumb and faces the open road? His real-life rides include the gentle 81-year-old farmer who is convinced Waters is a hobo, an indie band on tour, and the perverse filmmaker's unexpected hero, a young, sandy-haired Republican in a Corvette. So here we go, all right? Mr. Waters, right. Mr. Waters, Mr. Waters, we're getting started now. So talk to me, Mr. Waters. I love that Mr. Waters. Who well, would you not don't have to call me Mr. Well, Waters. I know, but I'd like Mr. Waters. The only people would call me that are police. I hear you. Who would not love a book that's the size of my early Nancy Drew books? <laughs> <laughs> I swear, did you know that? It's the same size as Nancy no. Drew. Yeah. It's, it's pretty much the same size as my last book, too. That I love that size. Yeah, they did a great job. And and it's so packed with humor and pathos and raunch as only you can do raunch. So tell me, were you sitting around with nothing to do and thought, gee, I think I'll hitchhike across America. Whoa, where did these ideas come from? Talk to me. Well, I don't ever sit around with nothing to do because I always have something to do. Every day I've got to think up weird stuff because that's what I do for my living. <laughs> 
No, I had a nostalgia for hitchhiking because when I was young in Catholic high school, my parents totally expected me to hitchhike home. It was not a bad thing at all. It was not thought of as a dangerous thing. And there were just as many perverts out then as there are now, but I guess my parents didn't know that, but I did, and I was looking for them. And then I hitchhiked in the hippie years, certainly, but the longest, I said, was probably Baltimore to Provincetown or San Francisco to L.A. And then I stopped hitchhiking, but every once in a while I would because I'd get to the train station in Baltimore, a blizzard or storm, and there'd be no cabs. So I'd hitchhike, and people would pick me up in one second because they'd recognize me. Then in Provincetown, I started to hitchhike again to Long Nook Beach because I didn't have a sticker. And then I liked it, so I'd ask people to go on hitchhiking dates, and that was my trainer wheels. And then that's sort of what gave me the idea. I thought, well, why don't I just, I have so much control in my life. Everything's so planned. Why don't I have a real adventure? It was my midlife crisis. I don't buy sports cars. I, I hitchhike across America. I think that's a great idea. I really, really do. But I thought it was really funny because you mentioned in the beginning of the book about your dad, and your dad had a thing about bums, and now you're going to go play this vagabond thing. Oh, I still have that poster that's all tattered, and it said, we're we're all bums on strike, <laughs> and that used to make him crazy when he would see that poster in my bedroom. And the word bum, they, that was a word that no one uses anymore. First of all, it's politically incorrect for homeless, but it, it meant something different than that bum. It just meant somebody that you didn't agree with, you know, some jerk. But we're all bums because that was the hippie sound that everyone's father always said, bums. <laughs> That's what he said, we're all bums. And it made him so nuts. I still have that poster. I saw it today in my studio. Isn't that fun? That's great that you had hold on to that. But, you know, it's funny because I'm thinking of you as a vagabond. <laughs> Crossing a crowd. Well, a vagabond sounds a little too um, Renaissance fair for me. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I could never go to Burning Man. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I would just crumble in Burning Man. This, you know, I'm, I was never a hippie. I looked like a hippie, but I was a yippie, and a yippie was more of a troublemaker. Even though I do believe in the goodness of people, I guess seriously, maybe I am a hippie because I believe in the basic goodness of people. And we're going to talk about that at the end of the show about you thinking about the goodness of people. But I want to ask you this, because you're going across America, America's heartland, where yeah. they don't always have a heart for gays or for, you know, well, anybody who's different. Well, the people that did, and to be honest, I don't think a gay person picked me up. Really? Um, as far as I could tell, my gay daughter isn't bad. Um, <laughs> I do not think a gay person picked me up. So I often wonder, are gays pussies about pick up, pitch, picking up hitchhikers? I mean, I pick up a hitchhiker uh, if I ever see one, and it used to be a way to cruise to hitchhike. But today, I think it is not, and I think you almost never see a hitchhiker. You so, don't. I don't know. Gay people don't even cruise anymore. They, they <laughs> dance in bars looking at their phones on Grindr. So like the rest me, of the if world. If you want to go cruising, yeah. Grindr is... <laughs> Hitchhiking is better than grinder. <laughs> oh my God, listen to you. Did this thing you bring up better what? people? Because the yeah. people that pick up hitchhikers are a special breed. And, and they're open minded. And I think with the internet and the way the world is today, that there is no hinterland anymore. I mean, in a way, everyone is the same in a weird way, in a, in a better way, in a way. I mean, um, everybody's closer together and, and more diverse today because of the internet and television and cable and, you know, everything that they see is worldwide. But I guess that there were people out there that would hate me, but they didn't pick me up. So the only people I met were people that were lovely and kind and, and not impressed by celebrity. Most of the people didn't know who I was, and if they told them, they just either didn't seem that impressed or thought I was a crazy homeless man that thought I was a film director. <laughs> so, you know, I'm thinking when I'm reading, I'm thinking Claudette Colbert and it happened one night, and I'm thinking, God forbid, Joel McRae and Sullivan's Travels and you know, even Ryan and Tatum Emil and maybe Kerouac. But, you know, this is really interesting. We are living in this 21st century so and there are boogeymen hiding out there john whether you want to admit it or not and, and i'm thinking aren't you yeah, scared to be honest boogeymen don't go after 66 year old film directors that's why when <laughs> well, i imagine cute. my death and the fictional parts of the worst i had a, a serial killer that preyed on cult film directors but unfortunately um young teenage girls are the ones that have the most disaster from hitchhiking i think you think okay i'll buy that I will buy that. But, but you know what? what? It's a disaster to stay home and never go out, too. I think that's oh, for sure. Than hitchhiking. Oh, absolutely. I'm with you on that one. You've got to live, live, live. That's what life is all about. Go out and enjoy. You yeah, would... stick out your thumb. Try a short version. Just next time you have to go to the supermarket. It's green. You're saving gas. It's a patriotic thing to do. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, there's a reason to do it. <laughs> Get, I live in Florida, honey. It is a nightmare down here. Florida right now is like like L.A. was in the 60s. You know, it is insanity over here. You don't want to be caught. You don't want to be hitchhiking. I just was in Florida. I was yeah. just in Tampa last weekend. Well, Tampa is a little packed. Yeah. So listen to me. You are the most creative person in the world. And you know what else you are? This is my observation. You were the most honest man on the face of the earth, and I love that. And I love oh, well, thank the, you. I do because somebody needs to be in this politically correct, you know. Blah, I am blah, blah. politically correct. Yeah, though. but I'm saying, but you're also honest. You were also honest. That's yeah, why your films are so wonderful. Yeah, and I make fun so of the rules of gay yeah. political correctness of and all. straight political correctness. But at the same time, mostly I, I'm fascinated by radical feminists and people that are overly politically correct. I, I think it's interesting. And I talk about that in my show a lot, that, that, um, and in my books, too, that, that, that you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with struggles within the gay minorities against each other, and I, I think it's all fascinating. Well, it is. It is. We are living in fascinating times. Things are very, um, what, multifaceted these days. It's not just one aspect. Well, it's not cut and dry. Right. Let's put it that way. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So listen, getting back to the fact that you're so damn creative and honest and this just terrific, terrific book. I love this. Well, thank you. I really did love this. Are you a best case scenario kind of guy? You start off this yes. with the fictional. Let me, let yeah, me just, I am. Yeah. I mean, I know that disaster can strike, but I believe that next day is always going to be better. Yeah, I believe in the future. I believe in the goodness of people. I I always believed somebody would pick me up. I never thought that I would be really frightened hitchhiking. And I always thought if I had a crazy one that really scared me, I was just going to say that I'm doing a reality show and they're filming me right now from a satellite and the cameras are on me. And if you leave, and you know, nobody can find you, but they're on me. And that might have worked. Okay, so talk to me about but that. But I never had to say it. It didn't. <laughs> nothing bad happened. No, but but I want to talk, I want to explore this. I mean, so you have the first part of this book. This book is so interestingly put together as only you could do. And the first part is fictional essays. The well, best. Me imagining the very right. best that could happen before, and I wrote those before I did it. Before I had checked. Well, yeah. And then the worst, and I imagined the most terrible things, which was even more fun. So the first but story, then, John. The yeah. first story. Talk, stay with me on this. The first story talks about yeah. you getting money to make a film, free money. No right. strings attached. Wish fulfillment? Of course. I mean, you know, it didn't happen for real, but certainly that is the best that could happen. You get a ride and someone gives you $5 million in cash to make your next movie and so there'll be no notes and uh, we, we don't really care if it makes money, so, <laughs> which would be, you know, almost impossible. So my question is, why aren't you making films? What's the deal? Because the last one wasn't successful and the entire independent film movement changed. And there's no such thing as a five to eight million dollar independent film. And I don't have the patience to be a faux underground filmmaker at 68. So you're going to, that's it? Or are you going back? I like books. The book's a bestseller. I go where they want me. You never going to make another film again? Who knows? I have meetings about it, but, you know, I'm certainly not waiting for that. I have many careers, and well, they're I all know. equally as important to me. Okay. So I don't know if I will. If I might do tell, I don't know. I don't know. But if I don't, it's not like I haven't spoken or been understood. Okay. And just for the record, did you get car sick as a kid? <laughs> did I get what? Car sick as a kid? No, I never got car sick. And that's funny. That's a good, because my friend Dennis Dermody said to me, when I got the book and took the cover off, it so freaked me out because the color of the book itself is the color of the car sick medicine <laughs> I had to take as a child. And I, that was an accident, believe me. The publisher did not do that on purpose. <laughs> but um, I, he said he was always car sick. No, I never got car sick. No, okay. All right, just had to ask you that. So let's talk about this fame thing just again. Let's get back to that. You are John Waters, cult film director director, actor, writer, visual director, hairspray, huge, bing, pink flamingo, huge. Cecil B. Demented, one of my favorites. You brought along a fame kit. <laughs> I love this. In case, well, in case, in case of emergency, I had a fame <laughs> kit, yes, that my assistant put together. So if, you know, they're going to haul me to jail, I can flash my Academy of Arts and Science <laughs> membership and say, hey, I vote for the Oscars. Oh, God. Which I did. It worked. I showed it to a policeman. He gave me a ride. Oh, I just think that's such a pistol. I really, really do. So the fame is it, the fame thing. Is it, now listen to where I'm going with this. So the fame thing is packed up in your old kit bag, and you're off on this journey with a smile, smile, smile. And you know, I have to tell you about this. When this work, this is how my crazy brain works. That song just popped into my head. I had no idea what a kit bag was. I sung that song a thousand times. I had to go and look. Which at one? It. 
kit bag, pack up your old, uh, what is it? Pa- you want me to do this on air? Pack up your old kit bag and smile, smile, and smile. You don't know that yeah. song? Remember that song? I don't think I do. Oh, go check that song out. You can use it. You'll love All right. it. All right. You better not sing it or you're going to have to pay for the rights. I'm not singing it. That's why I stopped, okay? And I didn't get all the words right. So anyway, how many times have um, I sung that song, as I said? But do you took a lot of stuff with you in your kit bag, which is your travel bag? I didn't bag. take that much. I traveled very light. I just had one little bag. It wasn't even a suitcase. Okay. I had six pairs of underwear, which I threw a pair away every day. I had some T-shirts. I had one jacket I wore the whole way. I had an umbrella. I had a flashlight. I had a credit card. No, I didn't take much And your La Mer Moisture Cream and Eye Concentrate. La Mer Moisture Cream I had, yeah. <laughs> I never heard of it. Me, my face was like, oh, my God, weather beaten from those Kansas <laughs> wind. Oh, my God, I look like a Walker Evans photo. I've never seen that stuff. I don't even know what is it is. Is it good stuff, La Mer? La Mer, oh, it's the best. Yeah, but it's ridiculous how much it costs. But I believe, I was thinking, think how much uglier I'd be if I didn't use it. <laughs> I never heard of it. i got to go look it up because vanity, my name is Hallie. And and anyway, you, you talk about in the beginning when you're holding on to this bag because it's really, and you're afraid it's going to get stolen. Talk to me. Well, I always, I used to be a thief, so I used to be terrible. We used to break in cars and steal Christmas presents. I used to go to the beach when people were swimming, take their pocketbook. I did terrible stuff. So I think I don't believe in karma because I know so many jerks that are alive today and so many great people that are dead. But I still realize that there are people out there that that could do bad things. So I, I didn't want to insult people by what, when I went into the bathroom and I'm going to rise and I got to take my whole suitcase with me, but I'd make up some excuse so they didn't feel that I didn't trust them. So you were a thief? What? <laughs> yes, of course. Everyone in the 60s was a thief. If you're ripping off the man, you know, ridiculous. But nowadays, you know, I, I when I'm in my friend's store in Provincetown, I'm the store detective, and if we catch you, we, you know, take you in the back and make you put on clothes that are two sizes too small, and <laughs> where we have a picture website called yesyouarefat.com. <laughs> God, John. Oh, my God, you're such a character. Part two of Karsik. The worst that could happen begins with a picture with the words midlife crisis, which you already admitted that this is part, yeah. like, part of your mental. So, so is this the neurotic John Walker Waters talking over the thought, taking over the thought process when you get into this worst case scenario? Well, the worst case scenario you think of is you get murdered, you get diarrhea. I mean, it is the worst. The worst is elimination while you're hitchhiking. You have to be careful when you're not at the wheel. So I didn't eat a lot because I didn't want to have to deal with that. But, um, Yes, the worst case thing is you get picked up by boars, you get picked up, you get ag- entrapped and arrested for a sex crime you didn't do. Like, also, you know, the worst is the most fun to write because you think, what is the worst thing that can happen to anybody? So um, I, I think I went pretty far with it. And, and is that how your head works? You go, you go in, that's how far you go into, oh, my God. Well, if I say it's the worst, I'm going to have fun with it. <laughs> yeah, it's just like a challenge. <laughs> fun. <laughs> and by the way... Your worst nightmare meeting Anita Bryant in heaven, or <laughs> yeah, no, but I'm going to hell and she's in heaven, right? <laughs> Although Anita Bryant was the best thing that ever happened to the gay movement. We need another one like her to, you know, to make everybody stronger and fight. She, is she still alive? Was she still no. around? No, she. She's and her not. career was totally. Oh, she was, she was destroyed. So. She was destroyed. Absolutely destroyed. Yeah. I never got her in the first place. I didn't get her as Miss America either. She never was my. Uh... Well, Miss America, I, I know someone who I met who I really liked, and her mother was a Miss America. And my friend said, oh, I got her autograph. And she wrote, this is my favorite autograph ever. She wrote, lest you forget, and then her name. <laughs> that is so amazing to me. that I, I too long to write in a book signing. But imagine if someone wrote that in your book. And like, wow, what does that mean? <laughs> no, but I went to summer camp with Bess Meyerson's daughter. And that really? was, yeah. I, mean, she would well, I used to watch Beth Myerson totally on um, the big payoff where you want a mink coat every week. Right, right. She was beautiful. Yeah. She, yeah, she didn't have a happy ending. Um, I want to digress for a second. I want to go to... Um, I don't think a lot of Miss Americas have happy Apparently. Endings. I don't know. I yeah. think it's downhill after the title. Gretchen, whatever her face is on Fox, there's her. Maybe, well, well maybe you know, she's happy. Yeah, yes. maybe she's happy. I don't know. She's got a career. Uh, it has nothing to do with Miss America. But I like the Miss America Foundation. I'm one of the few who says, God bless them. They're no, sending a lot of girls I to school. I don't hate them, you know, either. No, I, mean, I, know, I, I know, I know, I know, I know. I'm a radical feminist, but let them do it. So listen to me. You're a pretty serious guy, even though you're a very funny guy. 
obviously. Well, you think well, about I don't, know, I don't know quite what you mean by that, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious about my career, but I... I do you sleep know. or do you think? Are you a thinker? Oh, I can sleep so great. I cannot sleep anywhere, thank God, because I'm on the road all the time. Oh, okay. All right. I can sleep. I don't sleep on planes very well, but I, not because I'm scared. I'm scared of not flying. But... um. I can see them, you know, first of all, the hotels are putting in are nice. It's not like I'm in a flea bag. So who couldn't sleep in a suite in a hotel? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of people who don't sleep, buddy, i got to tell you. So listen to me. Well, I'll just try some melatonin. That usually works. <laughs> okay. Or okay. if you're a jazz musician, heroin. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, there you go. We got a heroin. And there's a story. You tried heroin, No, I you? tried it, but I hated it. But I'm not a jazz musician. If you're a jazz musician, and you then it have works. to take it, don't you? Isn't it jazz? Isn't it the sound it, yeah, it's, of heroin? It's part of the story, right? It's part of that jazz yeah, story. Yeah, it's the yeah. sound of heroin. My mother was very, when she was very ill, and I gave her morphine. I said, finally, you can understand Coltrane. Right? Right. Um, yeah, but she didn't think it was funny. But I tried to put earphones on her for cold trains so she could finally understand it when she was on morphine. Are you more like your mom or your dad? Well, I think I got my dad's work ethic, and my mom and dad had a sense of humor. I think um, I'm probably more like my mother politically. She she just passed away, didn't she? Didn't I read yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah, that must have been hard for you. Well, she was, no, it was harder when she was living at the end because she oh. had a very great life. And then at the end, last couple of years, she was like, it was pretty old age. It's not a pretty thing. So, um, it, no, if she was, it was, she had a great life. So it wasn't tragic. She died at 90. She had a great marriage to my dad that lasted her whole life. So, um, and look what she produced in you. Pretty good. Well, and she produced me. Yeah. <laughs> That's because I was born. I think I'm crazy because I was born six weeks early and I was overly baptized. <laughs> Is that it? <laughs> okay. That's what happened. I'm glad that you explained it all to me. Now I understand kind of, sort of, like maybe not. Listen to me. This is another thing that I find fascinating. When I finished reading the book. There's the fiction. There's the nonfiction. And you know, at the end, when I'm putting all this together in my head, I couldn't tell the difference. Like, it well, became my, meaningless. My assistant said, I can't tell the good and the bad. They all look bad. <laughs> no, that's not true. That's no, not but true. the real people were so, it was so unextreme in a way. I mean, they were all nice and everything, but they, and they helped me, but it was every single type. I mean, I got picked up by a minister's wife. I got picked up by a woman with a child. I got picked up by a truck driver. I got picked up by a coal miner. So a Republican. So, so you know, I think that the, the people in the real part were certainly not as extreme or melodramatic as the best and the worst rods. Right, but there was something, I don't know, maybe that's part of the thing that I wanted to get to, is because, like, is that what the, how it goes on in your head? Is there a huge difference with you, particularly when I look at your films, between reality and, 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 and fiction, that kind of blend? Well, they aren't that different. If you come, look, every yeah. person that was in that book and the best and worst parts could be in my movies, certainly. Right. Yeah, yeah. Hey, John, do you get you? Sure, uh, yeah, and I, only time recently, I, there was this, I live in Provincetown this summer, and I was downtown on my bike, and usually there's one little park bench, I know that no one is, and I go over there and check my Blackberry and make my calls if I'm in the middle of the day, and I'm out, and I sat down, and I said, this guy will never know who I am, somebody that really looked like he never saw me, so I sat down, and wait a minute, and he leaned over to me and said, explain, Pink Flamingo, <laughs> <laughs> I, thought, I said, no. It was the only time ever I was not nice to somebody. Um, if I have to explain it now, yeah, I get me, and I think most people get me. I, I'm not a misunderstood, tragic artist. Oh, I mean, my God, not at um, all. People got my humor pretty much from the beginning. It took 10 years to get good reviews, but people understood it right away. So, so here's what I want to say, okay? Indulge me. That I think that you understand us better than just about anybody else. Uh, that well, you that's have a compliment. I, I think I could be a good defense lawyer and a good shrink. Yeah, you could. But here's what you do that I've always admired and I was fascinated by when I first saw your first film. Wait, and I was a kid, but boy, what an influence that you can protect project us as we truly are versus what we think we ought to be. That is such a talent. Well, what everybody thinks they want to be changes as you get, if you're a healthy neurotic and learn to live with um, <laughs> America, what you are. And that's yeah. all I'm ever writing for is healthy neurotics. And I think readers are healthy neurotics. All right. I just, I guess where I'm going with that is that I think that you just portray for us something that we're not, that we can look at in ourselves and even laugh at ourselves in a dark movie theater that we may not be willing to admit or understand or, or, or attach ourselves to. 
And that's your genius, is that you allow oh, well, us. Thank you. No, I wanted to say that. I wanted to say that well, to you for a long time. Thank you, and I hope that's true, because what I'm trying to do is make you be surprised so you're less apt to judge people for behavior that some can never understand. Right, right. And it is. I mean, it's not, it's not it's surprising for sure, but it's also um, gives you permission. That, that a lot of us who were raised, uh, not maybe not in Catholic families, but in strict families, didn't always have. Well, there's all kind of families. Right, Even you know. Some people need to rebel that were raised in the most liberal families of all. That can be push you the other way. Right. All right, let's go back to Karsik for a minute, and I want to go back to the real journey. And it begins. Right. The true story of John Waters hitching across America. No imagination. And yet, what you write turns out to be brilliantly imaginative in its reality. How is that? You managed to make a Days In sound hilarious. And by the way, did Days In pay you for the mention? <laughs> the no, shirt. because, well, no, I like Days In. It was the holiday and I, I hated. No, um, I know that. I know. And uh, yeah, some of them I like. I mean, am I going to go stay in the Days In on my book tour? No. <laughs> but, you know, when you're hitchhiking across the country, there isn't a lot of choices on the where the places are on Route 70. So. I tried them all, and the days in was, to me, had the best lighting. That's the problem in all the places. It's impossible to read a book in a hotel room. They don't even sell newspapers, not even USA Today anymore. You can't get. And then try to read a book, impossible. It's like lit for what, romance? Who has a romance on Route 70 and the Holiday Inn with truckers? I mean, I don't think there's a lot of romance going on, even in the trucker areas, which... Believe me, that's all the sexual fantasies of truck stops. The real good ones are off the highways because they're police so much they can't be wild. Oh God, listen to you, listen to you. I want, I want you to do me a favor. I did, I, I threw this at you because we didn't talk pre-show. But could you re- read us just a little bit of this book because this book is so special? I, oh, thank you. I'll read just the opening. It's, okay, it's very go short. for it. I never uh, do this for anybody. Prologue is called "Going My Way." I haven't felt this excited or scared for a long time. Maybe ever. I just signed a book deal resulting from the shortest pitch ever. I, John Waters, will hitchhike alone from the front of my Baltimore house to my co-op apartment in San Francisco and see what happens. Simple, huh? Am I fucking nuts? Bridget Berlin, Andy Warhol's one-time most dangerous and glamorous 60s superstar, recently said to me, how can I be bad at 70? She's got a point. I mean, yes, I'm between pictures, as they say in Hollywood. But long ago, I realized as a so-called cult film director, not only did I need a plan B that was just as important to me as movie making, I needed a plan C, D, and E. But plan H for Hitchhike? I'm 66 years old, for Christ's sake. <laughs> this book is so... <laughs> that gives you a small introduction. I love this. Love this story. You wrote your own death <laughs> We don't all get to do that. You're what? Yeah, that was fun. You know, yeah, I'll bet. Yeah, especially in a horrible way. You had to think the most horrible way to be murdered. Uh, so you're nearing 70. Not there yeah. yet. But, so, and, and you've lost a lot of friends, and we just said you lost your parents uh, recently. Yeah. But, but, but writing that death. And, but, oh, what? it was funny, you know, because I knew that, what's the worst that's going to happen to you? You're killed. You know, that's the worst <laughs> hitchhiking thing. You always heal. You're going to be murdered. So I tried to think of a way that I could be murdered that was horrible and funny. And I hope I did. I don't want to give it away. No, we won't I'm give it away. Absolutely like not. But do you re- and by the way, just as a non sequitur, but it is, because if I bring you flowers when you do go, if you go before me, if I send them to you, black tulips? <laughs> black tulips and I've already bought a grave at the same place where Divine is mink bottom uh, couple, and we're all gonna be buried there and we call it disgrace land, so come <laughs> visit. <laughs> I love it, I love it, I love it. All right, bottom line, buddy. What did John Waters learn about himself from this adventure? That I had balls, that I had street cred, that I could hitchhike across America by myself, and I always said I was going to do it, but once I was in day three and I'd wake up in that holiday inn and hear that dull roar of traffic outside the window, think, am I actually doing this? <laughs> so I, I pat myself on the back for, for having an adventure at my age. Yeah, you're right. You're still young. And what, and what did you learn about? That would have been an adventure if I was 20. That, well, that's that more of adventure in a way. What would you learn? What did you learn about America? Just how what I always knew that the people are basically good and wish you well and are way more open minded than what they might do in a voting booth and what they might say in public. And if it affects them personally, they'll change their view. And John, this is the last one. This is a film, whether you like it or not. And whether you make it or not, but if somebody makes it, 
who should play John Waters? Well, be, if it was today, Steve Buscemi certainly should play him because flight attendants always ask me if I'm him, and um, he and I joke about it all the time. If it was somebody younger in the early part of my life, I would say Matthew Gray Goobler, who has played me before and, and has um, came on stage dressed as me and looks pretty good. He's more handsome, but he, he would be good as the young John Waters. As the young John Waters. Well, the young John Waters. The middle-aged young waters, and I'm going to call you middle-aged because I'm pretty sure. Oh, well, I'm not going to live to be 140. No, but so you'll. Yeah. Think, well, who knows? With you mon- know? all the monkey glands yeah. I've been shooting up lately, no, I'm just. <laughs> God, listen to you, John Waters. This is a fantastic book. Right, nice well, talking to you. Thank you very much. Really, thanks, buddy. I've been speaking with John Waters, American filmmaker, actor, visual artist, and author of Carsick a book laced with subversive humor and warm intelligence, an unforgettable vacation with a wickedly funny companion and a celebration of America's weird, astonishing, and generous people by cult hero John Waters. For more information about Mr. John Waters, surf the net. After graduating from the University of Maryland, Peter Melman, a New York native, became a writer for the Washington Post. He slid to television in 1982, writing for Sports Beat with Howard Cassell. From 1985 to 1990, he returned, as he says, to forming full sentences as a writer for numerous national publications, including the New York Times Magazine, GQ, Esquire, and, as he says, also writing for a multitude of women's magazines due to his advanced understanding of that gender. One year after moving to L.A., he wrote The Apartment, the first freelance episode produced by Seinfeld. Over the run of the show, Melman rose to executive producer and coined such Seinfeld-isms as yada yada, sponge-worthy, shrinkage, and double-dipping. In 1997, Melman joined DreamWorks and created It's Like You Know, a scathing TV look at L.A. In recent years, he's written screenplays and humor pieces for magazines and newspapers, several of which were published in his book, a collection called Mandela Was Late. And now he is out with a new book, a novel, It Won't Always Be This Great, which has received fabulous reviews, and may I say, well-deserved. I want to welcome to the Hallicaster Chain Show, the brilliant writer, Peter Melman. Peter, I want to thank you for your apt description of plantar warts. <laughs> yes, well, I, you know, I, I, I go a long way back with podiatry. <laughs> I gotta tell you, I read that and I was on the floor from that. I mean, really, this book of yours, it, it won't always be this great, has to be one of the funniest books that I've read. I said that to you off air because I really, and I want to say it on air, that's how good I thought this book was. I, I was going to give a synopsis, but I'm going to let you do that. It all begins with a bottle of, of horseradish what yes a um a 51 year old podiatrist and an incredibly perfect family man who absolutely loves his wife and kids which is kind of what the book is about in one way that it's a book about a guy who actually still is crazy about his wife after 24 years of marriage that's one of the big things the book is about but he is uh, forced to walk home on a freezing cold friday night and he winds up tripping over a bottle of horseradish that is just out there on the street. And um, he wrenches his ankle, and he's a basketball player still. So if you're still playing basketball at 50, your immediate thought when you hurt yourself is, I'll never play again. (laughs) And when he sees that it's a horseradish bottle, for some reason he becomes enraged and just throws it, and it winds up going through a window of a highly fashionable store owned by a prominent Orthodox Jew in his little Long Island town. And for the first time in his life, this podiatrist somehow decides not to be the perfect citizen, and he just walks away. And um, ultimately, of course, it's then seen as a hate crime. And he just keeps the story to himself the whole time. In fact, he's never told the story until the beginning of this book, where he's telling the story, but he's not really telling the story, because he's telling it to his college roommate, who happens to be in a coma. (laughs) Only you. (laughs) 
<laughs> Only you. I was, just, I was just thinking it was a nice way of, you know, getting some, you know, somebody who real rarely gets a chance to really express himself and to tell a story and to have the floor for a long time. What better person to talk to or to relate a story than to someone who's in a coma, you know, someone who can't interrupt? It really, it's the optimum, isn't it? Don't we all wish we had that? <laughs> Nobody would respond. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, but this is also essentially a story of a, a, a man's midlife crisis. Are you writing from experience? And how biographical, as I'm reading this, I'm wondering how biographical is all of this? It's virtually not autobiographical at all. Really? I mean, there are a lot of his opinions and views of life that are right in line with mine or directly out of mine. But as far as his circumstances and what kind of person he is, there's absolutely no comparison. You know, I mean, he is a person who kind of traded in his dreams for his dream girl, you know, his career dreams, he tossed aside basically for his dream girl who he met in college. It's very possible he has never dated anyone in his life except this one woman. And he's got, in addition to this wife, he's got two kids. And, you know, I'm not married and I don't have two kids. <laughs> but, you know, part of it was, you know, part of it is it drives me crazy that people are always saying, write what you know, because my feeling is, you know, if you're writing fiction, maybe you should make it up. Well, that's a really good thought, you know? Yeah, why not just make it up? And, you know, people have been telling me that, God, how do you write so confidently about, you know, a guy with wife and kids? And I'm thinking, you know, this isn't like some exotic tribal thing in, you know, in the middle, in outback Australia. I mean, this is the nuclear family in America. It's not that hard to imagine. No, for sure. Before we keep going with this book, I want to talk to you about you, I want to go back a little bit about you. Where'd you grow up? What kind of upbringing do you have that led to your developing this ridiculously brilliant comedic mind that you have? Were you a oh, funny kid? I grew up in Queens. You know, I was, you know, moderately funny, I guess. I don't know. Being funny kind of seemed important. Like if I ever got off a good joke in a classroom, I'd kind of think about it on the bus ride home. But, you know, I, I don't remember. It's, I don't remember that much of anything before college. You know, it's like, Really? Funny family or just you? Quietly funny. My mother is kind of has a bit of a caustic humor and my father was kind of qu very quiet but punny. <laughs> very in puns. Interesting. All right, so you go to the University of Maryland and then you work for the Washington Post writing what? Well, at that time, basically, I was out of college. I was trying to just get my name in the paper wherever I could, you know, so I did cover some school board meetings and stuff like that. But I, I got to do a lot of stuff in sports because I have kind of a sports background. To say the least. I mean, then you became the assistant to legendary sports commentator, Howard Cosell. I was a writer, writer on the show. Yeah. I got to tell you, I know, I knew Howard. Oh, my God. Really? What? Yeah. Yeah. I have a moment, but I refuse to tell it on air. I'll tell you in secret. It's so crazy. Yeah, yeah, I did, actually. He saved me once. I could almost imagine what the moment was, but yeah. <laughs> Let's leave it to the imagination. Yeah. But I will say you, he saved me. That, that I'll tell you. But I'll keep you, like, interested, and maybe, you know, we'll do that at another time. Anyway, so you worked for him. What was that like? Because he was You know, insane. it was really fantastic, not only just because you were in the middle of the entire sports universe and you were hanging out with this person – who year by year was simultaneously voted the most admired and the most hated man in America, you know, on those top yeah. 10 lists every year. But, you know, it was he was just such a force of nature. And on top of everything else, he was incredibly funny. You know, people are always, you know, asking me how much, you know, my experience on Seinfeld added, you know, contributed to writing this book. And I always say, you know, it contributed, but, you know, so did working for Howard Cosell. And Howard Cosell contributed to my working, my work at Seinfeld. And, you know, the Washington Post contributed to that. So, you know, you like to think that all the steps in your career kind of contribute to what you're doing now. Right, for sure. And you know that they do. You left New York, you go to the wilds of LA. And one year, one year later, you're writing for the most popular popular TV show ever, Seinfeld, which, by the way, I have to tell you, sounds to me like the Seinfeld script. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, right? It, I'll, I'll tell you, it, it sounds like a Seinfeld script, except it's not quite believable enough. <laughs> right. What's the story with that? How did that happen? That's beautiful. You know, I, I had met Larry David in New York once or twice, you know, and I knew that he was a comedian and um, I knew that he wrote some screenplays. And, you know, we, we spent a, a little time together and, you know, we got along well. I didn't give it much thought. And then I bumped into him when I moved, you know, a, about a year into my Los Angeles life. And he says, you know, I'm doing this little TV show with Jerry Seinfeld. 
Seinfeld. We, you know, we've done three episodes. Maybe you could write a script for us. And I had never really written in dialogue before, you know, unless you count making up quotes in your articles. But... <laughs> Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I was kidding. Yeah, right. And, and um, so he asked me for a writing sample. And like I said, I had no script. So I gave him an essay that I had written in the New York Times magazine. And it was kind of a funny piece. But it was also a little bit poignant, which is strange because, you know, Seinfeld was thoroughly allergic to any, any poignancy. But he passed it on to Jerry. And somehow Jerry just took a shine to the piece. And I got an opportunity to um, write a script and I got really lucky. Yeah, to say the least, you got really lucky. Absolutely. I, it's all luck. I mean, you know, you, luck, uh, luck is the biggest factor in anything. And talent. I mean, that helps, but, you know, you really do have right. to Right. You, you have to be in the right place at the right time and you surely as hell were in the right place at the right time. There's no question about that. I mean, wow, what that led to. Before we go further with that, I just have to ask you this about comedy writing because you made your, your, your real bucks uh, and your real career move writing for television scripts. Now you're writing a novel. Different muscles? What? Different muscles in that, you know, I'm writing full sentences all the time now. And, <laughs> you know. I've, I've, not yada, yada, yada. <laughs> yeah. And not, get out. No, you get out. I, no, I re it really happened. You know, I mean, <clears throat> you could go three pages of a Seinfeld script and not, you know, have one noun and verb that agree with each other. <laughs> And also, you know, I don't have, a, I didn't have anyone standing over me waiting for my work at the end of a day or at the end of a week. That was kind of new. And, um, you know, you were creating an entire world, which, you know, the world of Seinfeld existed in some form from day one for me. Right. You know, it, it certainly evolved a lot over the years, but it existed. And so, yeah, it was a, it was a huge change, but um, there was something really liberating about it. And I'm not the most disciplined writer in the world, but I have to tell you when I was in the middle of this I couldn't wait to get back to it I'd be in the middle of lunch with friends and think of something and go oh I uh, can't wait to get back and get that in there that's interesting because you really love this th this story and you love these characters clearly and that shows in the book there's no doubt about that I want to talk to you about your brand of comedy uh, is it definable or is comedy something that's inherently instinctive and, and and were it to be defined would it lose its magic yes I think it would lose its magic if it were defined I I can't really define it and you know the people who I I enjoy in comedy are so widely divergent. You know, I mean, I love Sarah Silverman and I love, um, you know, the, the Zucker, Zucker and Abrams, the guys who did Airplane. And, you know, and I love like the movie Arthur and I love Woody Allen and Philip Roth and, and John Updike, all of whom I think are incredibly funny. And all of, if you put them all together, that's you. Um, I mean, those are, those are certainly people who have influenced me. And you, as I have come to know your work <laughs> over the years, yeah, they're all in there. It's interesting. It's totally interesting. Are your dreams funny? God, it is so weird that you're saying that because last night... <laughs> I had the most bizarre dream. I have done, in the last three months, I've done stand-up comedy twice just to try it. I got talked into it, and I always had it in the back of my mind that it would be fun to try, but I was almost resigned to the fact that I never would. And then somebody talked me into it. You know, I met a 23-year-old girl who's a comedian, and we were just talking one day, and she convinced me thoroughly because, you know, a 23-year-old girl could pretty much talk me into anything. So, um... Oh, God. So I did stand up two times and I really enjoyed it and I kind of want to do it again. But, you know, with this book tour and everything like that, I haven't really had the chance. But last night I had this dream where I was waiting in the wings to finally do stand up again. And then some a friend of mine comes in and says, now you have you know that all your jokes have to be about the environment. They ha This is all about the environment. I say, like, what are you talking about? I'm at a couple. Why does it have about the environment? It was bizarre. Oh, baby. Oh, baby. I had a bizarre dream last night, too. Is it a full moon? And I don't even dream. Really? Yeah. I mean, I never, I, well, I'm sure I dream, but I don't remember dreams. But last night I had a doozy. I was like, oh my God, what is this? This is crazy. I mean, crazy. Did, with big, did you wake up out of it? I did. And with big bear and big fluffy thing, I don't know. Uh, I, I, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could do a couple of numbers on that. I'm asking you all these questions about the art of comedy, but but do you think you're funny or neurotic or maybe even psychotic? I mean, do you have to be a little crazy to be funny? Come on, tell me. I don't think so. I, I mean, I, I think I'm pretty grounded and normal, to tell you the truth. I mean, I you know, in my mind, I think of things in a funny way, but I think partially it's because I'm more on the lookout for things that are funny than the average person. And, you know, that I definitely owe to Seinfeld. 
Seinfeld. You know, Seinfeld got me in this head where I was constantly on the lookout for my own funny thoughts or little tiny funny things that happen. And, you know, I think that's something you can train yourself to be. You know, I I don't mystify humor as much as most people do. I, I think you can learn to just look at things and be much more aware of small things in the world. I mean, you know, it, I really had a tremendous evolution from being from in journalism where you're basically looking at the outside world, you know, you're an observer, to Seinfeld where you really have to observe your own thoughts. That's a huge transition, but, you know, I pretty much made it. To say the least. You know, it's funny because I was going to ask you that. I was going to I was going to ask you, do you see dead people? Because to me, you have to kind of think with your eyes to see something different from the rest of us. Do you know what I'm saying? Because comedy is observation, isn't it? I mean, it, it certainly is in some ways, but I think it's also association. You know, it's what you associate when you see something strange or different. What's your first association? Hmm. You know, I mean, when you look at the news, do you have kind of like an association with something that's happening in the world and you make an instant funny comparison to something else? You know, I think that's what great comedians do. You know, certainly the great observational and topical comedians, they have these bizarre associations. Mm, all right. And uh, yeah, that's where I was going with it. You- I think it also helps to have some, I don't want to say obsessions, but, you know, <laughs> things that preoccupy you, yourself. Like- I, you know, I kind of realized on Seinfeld that I did three episodes dealing in contraception. <laughs> you know, in one way or another. And I did three or four episodes on, you know, that dealt with some form of plastic surgery or changing your entire appearance or who you are. So talk to me. I'm Dr. Halley. Tell me about it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, I really love the whole thing about, you know, changing your appearance. I guess the whole idea of being able to reinvent yourself in America in so many ways is really fascinating to me. Well, that is for sure true. Absolutely. I want to tie this back to just a minute ago because I really wanted to ask you this question. Do you get why people always laugh at what you say or do you not understand when people laugh at what you have to say? That's a really interesting question because I realized recently that sometimes people laugh at what I say not so much because it's funny, just because it's something that they would have never thought of. You know, I just started realizing that I don't really think like everybody else or like most people do. So people find it amusing. And, you know, you do also find that, you know, in conversations that very few people are really shocking you with what they think or their points of view or not even shocking you, just even surprising you or throwing you off just a little bit. And um, that doesn't seem to take a whole lot of effort for me. Yeah. Which leads me to this. Uh, and I want to get because I want to take it back to it won't always be this great this great book why do the stories about neurotic Jewish men and angst so tickle our phony bones <laughs> what, what is that I mean is this the absurdity that a man has in his angst can that he can get himself into the fixes that he does is that what's causing us to laugh I mean there's something inherently sad there as well yeah I think there's always a feeling of you know there's always a clash in these kind of men between their fantasy lives and and their reality and their reality feels like it's closed in and trapped and their fantasies just get progressively crazier and crazier and you know a big part of the book also is about middle-aged men who just lose it <laughs> who just completely lose it. You know, like there's a podiatrist at the convention. He's at a podiatry convention. And, you know, a guy who's supposed to give his first presentation at, at a podiatry convention just loses it. He's preparing for his presentation so, so adamantly and that he just loses it. And, you know, it just, it does seem to me that a lot of people my age kind of just lose go, it. go off the rails a little bit. It's true. It's true. Men in particular, by the way. <laughs> much more yeah. than much more uh, than women. Absolutely. Yeah, you know, and you wonder about that. I want to talk to you about Jews and comedy. I I, I recently asked uh, Carl Reiner about it, about Jews and comedy. And you know what he yeah, said to me? He's. Oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> 
<laughs> I got it. But I asked Carl about it, and you know what his answer to me was? He, he thinks it has to do with Jews being the underdog. Right. So I'm curious what you think. Because could a Goy have written Seinfeld, or It Won't Always Be This Great? Or is this brand of comedy we're talking about strictly from the purview of Jews? What's the deal? I'm Jewish. I'm asking you. So. Um, I think a non-Jew can do it. You know, I, I don't really, mm. you know, maybe, you know, for Carl's demographic, politely put, I think he's got a little bit more of an underdog mentality than I do. You know, I mean, I grew up and I, you know, I thought pretty much everyone was Jewish or they were all over the place. I never felt like I had to put out any effort to assimilate or anything like that. And I'm sure Carl's upbringing was way different than that. So I never really felt that underdog mentality. Well, I uh, think what he meant by that was he was just saying it's from the, that point of view of being, no matter how are you looking, there's less of us than there are of them, so to speak, that perhaps that causes you to look at it, at, at the world a little bit differently. I don't know. You don't think so. Well, you know, John Updike is my favorite writer and, you know, the rabbit books are, you know, the, my favorite books of all time. And um, I think rabbit's point of view is not that much different than, you know, the standard protagonist of Jewish novels. You know, he's really inside his head and, you know, his feelings are so all over the place. And occasionally he just snaps, you know, like once every book. He pretty much snaps or does something incredibly untoward, which is, you know, what happens a lot in Philip Roth books. And um, so, you know, I, I don't think that uh, the Jewish thing is really that pronounced any, not certainly not anymore. Hmm, interesting. Let's go back to um, it won't always be this great. Finding that sweet spot. Just that right place where what you have to say is funny and absurd and ridiculous and yet believable and important. Is what you create social commentary disguised in comedic delivery? Or is it a comedy that might be socially relevant? Or do you even think about being relevant at all? Well, you know, I certainly had a lot of opportunity and took all those opportunities, basically, to go on huge digressions, you know, about life and liberty in this uh, great happy country of ours. So, you know, there is a lot of social commentary in there. And, you know, that is kind of important to me, you know, it, and, you know, it's it was kind of important in Seinfeld, too, you know. And so, you know, in Seinfeld, you could say things about the society and it could actually have some real resonance oh. on the society as a whole. So, you know, that was something that became something that I wanted, you know, that that was became a very relevant factor. And, you know, also you just get a tremendous amount of opportunities in this book. Look, I did to um, comment on what you see, you know, like the whole thing about parenting and, you know, about the way, you, you know, the way like nobody, n nobody can have a kid who's kind of a mess now and not have a diagnosis for it. <laughs> It's you know, true. It's true. All my, you know, this got, you know, this really got me around to thinking a lot about parenting and things like that. You know, this, you know, it, it, it's just amazing to me that the worst thing in the world that you can be referred to now is a bad parent. Mm -hmm. You know, you could be, you could, you could cure cancer, but if you're a lousy parent, that's what you're known as, you know, and it's such a strange thing because... You know, everyone always talks about how being a parent is the hardest job in the world. Well, if it's so hard, then people are going to suck at it, aren't they? <laughs> You know, I don't know. I find I find it very with even with that. I mean, without kids, I find it very hard and harsh and to be a parent right now. For sure, for sure. So a lot of that out in the book. You know, a lot of my thoughts out about. Oh that. yeah. Oh, I'm not saying that it wasn't social. I just wanted to hear what you had to say and how important that was to you because I think that is the genius of both Seinfeld and particularly of this book is the fact that you are so able to put those thoughts out there in such a funny way. I, I want to read you a bit from your book. It won't always be this great. And forgive me for reading it because I'm sure you wrote it with different intonations. But this is cr made me crazy. Audra was a plain looking 14 year old, longish face with flat, pale skin and kind of short teeth that made you want to reach in with a pair of pliers and pull them down further from her gums. <laughs> So I'm reading this and I'm saying to myself, this guy just come from the dentist. Did he just finish brushing his teeth? Where the hell did this come from? Will you tell me? It's hilarious. I don't know. You know, I, I don't know where that came from. Be you know, I just I did want this to be a character who at 14 looks like that. And somehow later when he sees yeah, right. her at 19, she has grown into herself. You know, she's all of a sudden now she's become an extre extremely attractive woman. So, you know, so I gave her a few physical faults. <laughs> 
you know, things that could be improved upon. And, you know, she grew into herself. It killed me. This book, I would love to do a whole lot more of those because I've got, I've got two pages of, of quotes from that that I've written down. I mean, because it just killed me. It, so if you hadn't been a comedy writer, what, sports writer? You wanted to be Howard Cosell and you're... And you're... <laughs> Ooh, what were you going to do? I don't know. I never really had any plans, you know? Oh, really? So you just kind of fell into life, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, when I was in college, I, I was writing a lot for the school newspaper, and I thought, how great would it be to be at the Washington Post? So, you know, I, I wangled my way in. <laughs> but that was about, you know, the only goal I had. And then, you know, you just kind of hope the next thing comes along. Okay, so before we go, will you play a game with me? Sure. All right. I'm going to throw out some names of comedians, and uh, I want you to give me what comes to mind when I say Jerry Seinfeld. Um. Um. <laughs> my, my my boss, extremely for me, funnier in person than in his stand up. You know, a little bit more of an edge, and um, you know, never at a loss for an analogy. Hmm. You know, I, I it's funny. I, I I keep talking about this one day where I came into work when I had just bought my house, and I remember walking into Larry and Jerry's office and said, "God, I can how can I get married now? I love this house. I can't <laughs> share it." And Larry David goes, "Well, that's why the key to a good marriage is having a huge house." And Jerry says, nah, they find you. <laughs> you know, so yeah. that, was his kind of, that was the kind of humor I love out of Jerry. Okay, next. <laughs> uh, Sarah Silverman. You mentioned her. I love her. I am a Sarah Silverman freak. I think she's absolutely brilliant. And just her, per- not all, I mean, her material is out of this world and her performance skills are extraordinary. Just her hands, her, her facial expressions and she's built up the most incredibly brilliant persona of like Aaron, arrogant obliviousness. I, I love everything about her. She's my favorite. She's brilliant. She really is. Larry David. Larry is, um, you know, it's, it's funny. I think, you know, if Larry never got a dime for what he really do, did, he'd be doing the exact same thing. You know, he is truly his own force of nature. Um, Julia Louise Dreyfus. Just off the charts as far as a comedic actress. Uh, and, you know, it's, just mind blowing to be around her and it never got bored. And, you know, once uh, towards the end of Seinfeld, I, I said one said, you know, like, why don't you try, maybe you should try this line, you know, in this, in this way. And she goes, Oh yeah, great idea. And, you know, like after seven years, I was still getting a thrill that Julia Louis Dreyfus would even (laughs) I consider one of my suggestions. (laughs) Love it. Jimmy Fallon. You know, I was never like a giant fan of his comedy, but as a host of a talk show, he's really found his place. I mean, he's just great at it. He really is, isn't he? Oh my gosh. And it gets better and better and better. I was, you know, I was never like a gigantic fan of his comedy or, no, his, me either. or, of his, or his sensibility, but. Boy, he's good at this. He is really good. Carl Reiner. Carl Reiner is absolutely brilliant. You know, I got to know him a little bit. We worked on a, a DreamWorks animation project together. And, um, you know, it was really incredible being around him. And it was also kind of eye-opening because he had a book out once and he was doing a, a Q&A thing at the Skirball Center in Los Angeles. And he asked me if I would be the person who throws out the cues. And really? he was really nervous in the green room beforehand. And I was like, God, I can't believe it. This guy who's done so much is still nervous. It's like right. amazing to me. He is the nicest man ever. That's, he is a lovely man. Right? I mean, it That's makes you so- crazy that that, that 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 he's as nice as he is. Who would you have mentioned? Who should I have asked you that I didn't? Um, let's see. The, I was thinking, who? The, I think the funniest people in the world right now are Sarah Silverman, the, the South Park guys, absolutely incredibly fearless. Oh, and I'm crazy about Lena Dunham, who I think is just fearless and brilliant, and she gets all kinds of grief because she's got more nerve and you know than anybody else. I'm such a huge fan. And I have to say the basketball player, Blake Griffin, is about the funniest person on earth. (laughs) And only you would do that. You know, I I did this sports interview series called Peter Melman's Narrow World. Yes. And if you look at the interview with Blake Griffin, he is mind blowing how funny this guy is. He's so deadpan and he's hysterical. He's he's kind of like a comedy genius. So before we go, anything you want to ask me? (laughs) 
Um, yes. Could you spend uh, the rest of this year just telling people how much you love my book? I'll do my it would, best. It would save me a lot of traveling, and <laughs> you know, and, and you know, I'm not good at promoting myself. You know, I mean, it's such a weird thing. I'm a writer. I mean, by definition, I'm supposed to be somebody who tends to sit home and write alone. And now I got to go out and sell like I'm Willie Loman. Well, I think you're doing a gosh darn good job. How do you like that? What a pleasure to uh, talk to you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Talking to you. I've been speaking with Peter Melman, former Seinfeld writer and author of the hilarious new book, It Won't Always Be This Great. Do yourselves a favor, read this book. You'll laugh till you cry. Before I go, I want to remind everyone that podcasts of current and past shows are always available to listen to free on iTunes under The Halle Casser Jane Show. The Halle Casser Jane Show was also available for download via Spreaker.com, Stitcher.com, BlogTalkRadio.com, and a host of other venues. Google The Halle Casser Jane Show, and you will find us. Of course, podcasts over shows, both past and present, are always posted for your listening pleasure at HalleCasserJane.com which I hope you'll visit often for the latest information on our upcoming segments. Oh, and while you're at HallieCasserJane.com, don't forget to visit my blog to read my latest musings. I'll be back next week, same time, 3 p.m. Eastern, for another edition of the Halle Casser Jane Show, Talk Radio for Fine Minds, brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook download at www.audibletrial.com forward slash the Halle Casser Jane Show. Audible.com features over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or MP3 player. Stay in touch, won't you? Remember, that's HalleyCasserJane.com. Discover us on Facebook at HalleyCasserJane and on Twitter at HalleyCJ. I love to hear from you. So, till we meet again, this is Hallie Casser Jane. It's a wrap. <laughs>